Thanks for joining us for today's live Q&A. Today we're going to harvest a bit of honey and while I was setting up I noticed that there was ants under the roof. So what I'm going to show you how to do is how to activate your ant guards and, and keep up. those ants away from bothering you when they get behind the covers. Now ants aren't a problem for the hive themselves, the bees will keep them out of the inside of the hive, but they're a problem for us humans that find it unsightly to have a whole bunch of ants behind the covers. And as I was setting up, I noticed there was ants on this hive. So I'll show you how to quickly use these ant guards down here. So first of all, let's just have a look at what is going on and check behind the covers under the roof for ants. So under the roof is a classic spot. You can see them all running around there and they're quite large ants. So that means we'll be using a higher setting with our ant guards. So first of all, grab a bee brush and just brush all the ants away from behind all of the covers. And that's simple enough to do and sometimes there's a whole lot of ant eggs and things like that. What we're trying to do is brush them away so they'll set up shop somewhere else. Now, if we brush them off the top here, and then make sure you check behind all of the covers. So if we take that one off, you can see there's a couple in there as well. And a lot of getting them off the hive eggs, body like is that. a good idea. Some of them have landed in our honey jar. So we'll tip them out. Here we go. Now, once you've brushed all of the ants away, the next thing to do is make sure there isn't foliage touching the hive like this. Otherwise the ants will just find a new pathway straight up the foliage and onto the hive. So you'll need to perhaps give your garden a little bit of a prune. And then we have our ant guards down here, which fit to our Flow Hive 2 and Flow Hive 2 Plus. And what you'll need to do is wind the cover up and the base down. Like that, you can see an ant trying to get up already. So what we're trying to do is create a barrier which they find hard to walk up. And we can do that by putting some petroleum jelly in there, Vaseline, or we can use vegetable oil. Now some people complain that vegetable oil attracts rodents that'll chew their ant guards. So if you're having that problem, then perhaps using a petroleum-based Vaseline will be better. But you're just putting a couple of capsules in here and what that'll do is create a bit of a moat that the bees have to walk across. Sorry, the ants have to walk across and they can't get across it, especially if you set to a higher setting for these larger ants. Little ants, you can screw the cap all the way down. So that's all you need to do. I've already done the front two. So we go around and do all four and now we're just screwing this down, right? Now if you've got small ants, screw it all the way down and there'll still be a gap left. If you've got these larger ants that we have today, then I'm actually going to leave this up a little ways so they can't just step across the gap here, but it will still provide a rain shelter so that your oil doesn't flush out straight away. Having said that, in heavy rain, it's typical to have to come back and re-put the oil in. What will happen is the water will flush out the vegetable oil and then the water will provide a barrier for a little bit till it evaporates and you'll need to put in another lot of oil or Vaseline. We've also got an underside here underneath. If you're using Vaseline, we've left a little pocket under here for that as well. And what you have to do is brush the ants away a couple of times usually. And once you've done that and you've checked behind all the covers and brushed them away a few times, then the ants will go away for a while. And next time you see them come back, you can repeat the process. So if you've got questions, put it in the comments. We're going to harvest a bit of honey while we're here from this beautiful hive which Sarah has painted. It's an amazing education piece. Look at that artwork, it's incredible. And right on the cover I took off, you've got the 
cycle of the larvae starting from an egg moving through to a grub and then this is what's happening when it's going through its metamorphosis inside the cell when it's in its cocoon phase and then it emerges into the hive as a worker bee or if it's a larger cell it'll be a drone bee and if it's a really large peanut shaped cell it'll be a queen. So what we're doing is having a look to see if we do have any honey to harvest and I'm looking in here and I can see honey beneath their feet there. So we can go ahead and harvest that frame even though it's not all capped at the back. I'm pretty sure by looking at that that this frame is nice and capped and ready to harvest. Any questions? Yeah, Sing so it Oh, okay. Well, here's one from Dirty Rascal saying um, the hive swarmed last fall and, and they have a new package of bees ready to arrive soon. Just wondering, can they leave the old comb for the new bees or should they let them start fresh? Okay, so the bees absconded. Yeah, so the bees left and they've got all the comb though and he's about to get a new package. Can he just mm. put the new bees in there or should he start with fresh comb again? Well, it depends. If it's looking really nice, so the question is, you've got some old comb and you've got a new package, should you use the old comb? Most of the time we don't just because there could be a pathogen issue from the old comb that will transfer through to the new bees. Having said that, if you're pretty sure there was no issues like AFB or uh, EFB or chalk brood, then you can reuse some of those frames. However, if they've got any sign of like fermentation and mold and things like that, then I wouldn't. But if they're reasonably fresh and looking nice, then you could go ahead and give them a couple of those if you want to give them a head start. But otherwise your package will get along fine creating their own comb. And you can either use foundation sheets with our frames or you can use the comb guides and just let them draw it perfectly naturally themselves. So. A little bit up to you on that one. I'm just going to turn the key here, like this. I'm doing it in segments just to make it easier for me. There we go. It's actually not too hard today. Depends on how the bees have waxed up all the parts and also the temperature it is will affect how easy it is to turn as well. So that's the frame we're harvesting honey out of and pretty soon you'll see the honey flowing right out of that frame while the bees are standing on it hardly noticing anything's changed. There it is, beautiful. So I've gone for a nice big jar today so that I can uh, answer questions and I don't have to keep swapping the jars but you could of course use this size jar which you often see us using or these size jars actually hold a whole frame as well and that's a lovely thing to have on your kitchen benches, flutes of different colours of honey from different hives. That's your typical pasta jar that holds two litres. So two litres is how much you get out of one of these frames. Sometimes it'll overflow but not usually. So keep an eye on it towards the end. Great. So I had a customer actually yesterday and I said I'd ask this question to you today. Um, in Sydney has got a full flow hive but when they're extracting the honey, the honey's not coming out of the frames and was just wondering why would that be? Okay, they've got full flow frames and the honey's not coming out. Yeah. So we might need a few more pictures than that. That's, a, that's an unusual scenario where uh, you've turned the key and the honey's not coming out. So uh, forgive me if I'm covering basics, but the key needs to go in the bottom slot here when you turn it and the parts need to lift. So have a look down here and check that those parts have lifted compared to the next one here. So if I pull that out, you can see that, that one's lower than that one. And if those parts have lifted and you've got a slope to the, to the rear, you should see the honey coming out. Sometimes you can get really sticky frames that can take a while to lift. And that means just leave your key in there while the parts then slowly move into the cell open position. Now there could be two reasons I can think of. 
if you have successfully lifted the frame parts but the honey's not coming out. One could be candied honey in there, which is very unusual. I've almost never heard of that causing an issue in the frame. And the other one is thixotropic, like the Manuka honey is a thixotropic honey which sets like jelly. And if it's set like jelly in the frames, we find that if it's a 50-50 mix, it'll still come out in globules, but if it's 100%, then it might get stuck in the frame and not come out. So that could be the reason, in which case you might have some nice medicinal honey from the Manuka family, which is very hard to extract no matter what method you use because it has that jelly-like uh, thixotropic property and it sets in the frames. Typically, if you attempt to harvest a frame, then you'll disrupt it enough that the bees will tear the capping off, chew out the honey, and put in some more liquid honey and the whole process should start again hopefully with liquid honey next time. Let us know how you go, send us a few pictures, I'm quite interested because it's a very unusual scenario. Yeah that's great, so that's sort of what we ended up discussing, so he said he would and we sort of thought it could have been those, so he's going to keep us tuned on that one. Um, now see we, we want you to do a bit of a shout out, we've got all these student, students in Melbourne Polytech studying their Certificate 3 in beekeeping, so I'm assuming they're watching the Flow Hive live today. Excellent, excellent, good to hear. It's great that uh, so many people are studying these fascinating little insects and if you've got questions then chime in. Be uh, really happy to answer and what you'll find here is if I don't have the answer then other people from all around the world will chime in and help answer so it's a great place to uh, put your questions and get them answered. Fantastic. Um, Isa is asking what type of bees are in the flow hive? So this is the European honeybee, which we happen to have a great diagram of here by Sarah. And it's your typical bee that you see around in your garden. There is 20,000 species of bee in the world almost. And this is the one humans have dragged all around the world wherever they go because they're such extreme little pollinators and they also make an amazing amount of honey. So they've been really useful and they continue to be really useful for humans and their agriculture. So there are other species in the world that do work with the flow hive but this is 99.99% .99 of people using the European honeybee which there's lots of different breeds of. You'll hear Italians, Carnolians, Caucasians etc. But they're actually all the same Apis mellifera. We had, uh, we had a little late start this morning because we were so excited to see both blue banded bees and teddy bear bees right on this flower here. So I was busy filming them with the, with the macro lens trying to get a good shot of the teddy bear bee and the blue banded bee which are two of our iconic Australian native bees here. The teddy bear is like a big fluffy bumblebee looking bee and the blue banded has these bright blue st stripes and it's a pretty big bee as well and they were both here together. We'll post a little shot of that so you know what we're talking about. But that, that's, um, those type of bees don't work in a flow hive. They're solitary bees that just need a hole in the mud or a little bamboo tube. We've got some good footage of them using our pollinator houses. Uh, even though blue banded bees typically use mud, they will actually use our pollinator houses as well. Great. Cedar, um, this is from um, Hoover on TikTok. Um, they live in an area where the farmers are spraying their fields. How can they raise bees? Or how can they keep their bees while the farm is kind of spraying, obviously, pesticides? Yeah, that is a tricky one. And if you find a carpet of dead bees out in front of the hive, it's typical to have a few bees, but if, if you have like a carpet of them and they've all got their tongues hanging out, that's a pesticide kill where the bees have actually gone, sucked on flowers that have been sprayed with insecticides and they've come back and died and the undertakers in the hive have dragged them out the front. So it's sad when you see that happen and I have seen that happen. So what you can do about it is educate if you can. There is guidelines on when farmers are allowed to spray and they should be following those to limit that happening. So typically if 
uh, they're using a spray that does harm bees, then they're supposed to spray in the evening when all the bees have gone home and then the spray is set by the next day, theoretically. So that's um, one thing that can help is a little education. The other one is if you're really worried about it and you're in contact with the farmers and knew when they were spraying, you could choose to close the entrance of your hive in the early morning so your bees couldn't forage that day and that would also limit uh, the insecticide, uh, I guess, dose if they went foraging. Great. See, the Margaret um, on YouTube is asking, they're coming into spring but haven't done an inspection yet, waiting for the temperatures to warm up a bit. They have a couple of deeps on their hive. Margaret's question is when, when she inspects and how will they know when to put the super on? So great, excellent, I'm glad you're, you're into your beekeeping. Now, when you do your brood inspections as the colony's building up, what you want to do is wait for all of the frames to be being used by the bees, i.e. they've drawn out their comb and completed all of the frames before you put your super on. If you put it on early and you're in a warm climate, then that's fine, the bees will just take their merry time to actually get up here and use it. But if you're in an area that's getting cold, then you want to put this on later. Otherwise, you're just giving them extra space before they need it. So for that reason, we recommend you wait till the bees have filled all of the frames in the bottom box and there's a lot of bees and it's time then to put your super on. The only caveat to that is if there's a long time with no flowers ahead, which in many areas is a long cold snowy winter then you might not choose to put the super on at all and just get them through with a smaller sized hive because in those cold areas you don't want to have a large area for the bees to keep warm if you don't have to. True Life Journey is asking first time beekeepers and are still getting lots of rain sounds like they're in our area um, at the moment, but just wondering, can they do a brood inspection, I guess with all this rain? They checked it about five weeks ago and it was all looking really good. It's a good idea to wait for a nice warm sunny day where there's not too much wind, your mid-morning to mid-afternoon, that's ideal. However, if there's an issue, you might need to do brood inspections when it's not ideal. But if everything's looking good, then just wait for a nice warm sunny day. So look in the windows, there's no real issues present. There's plenty of bees in there. The bees are coming in and out. They're collecting their pollen and nectar. You're not seeing a contraction in numbers. And take a look at the landing board early in the morning and that'll give you a good idea of what's going on in the hive. If they're dragging out, for instance, you might notice they're dragging out bees that have been not quite formed yet, but they're, they're deformed and that could be a sign that the hive beetles are doing some damage in there, in which case you might need to get in there and assist them. But if everything's looking normal, then just wait for a nice warm sunny day. Nice. Um, Cedar, does this ha um, harm the bees in any way when you harvest the honey? So that's a great question and one we put a lot of thought and years of design work into. So my father and I worked on the flow frames here for a decade before we brought it to market in 2015 and we've actually got a whole patent about uh, about that issue because what we noticed on our journey of inventing was if you had frame parts like this which touched each other came apart and back again if there was bees down the cells now ideally you're harvesting when there's not bees down the cells because the honey's full but you can't always guarantee it so let's say there's an area of the frame that still has bees doing work down the cells when you turn the key now if a bee was down there and went like this then the bee might be stuck in there or it might be or it might reverse out depending and when it closes again it could have a wing or a leg through this area here so what we did in our design work is we left a v-shaped gap like that which meant that the bees have to complete the cell by filling in that area with a bridge of wax top and bottom 
and that means when the parts move to create the zigzagging channels and come back again then there's gaps there for the bees knees and no bees are harmed in that area. And I can quite confident, confidently say that a lot less bees are harmed with this kind of extracting than conventional methods. Right. Nathan's wondering, Nathan, Nathan lives in a much colder climate than we do and runs two brood boxes. Oh, there's a plane just flying over. <laughs> um, and just wondering, is it okay? Wait, wait for that. Urgent flow hive delivery on yeah. its way. Yeah, old sister. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so sorry Nathan, back to you. Lives in a really cold climate, runs two brood boxes. And any thoughts about flipping them in the spring to force the bees to the lower box? So swapping his brood boxes around. You can move the brood boxes around to get them to, to prioritise. But really, you could probably just wait for the bees and they will start using the second box when they're ready to do so. Typically if they've got a whole lot of space they don't need you could uh, take the whole brew box off and let them build up a bit more or you could just leave it on and some patients will get you there as the bees find that nectar, the queen starts laying more eggs, the colony expands and they're ready to fill that next box. I find that keeping it in this configuration is good because it's easier to find the queen in a single box to do your brood inspections and if you count up all the cells there is enough cells there for the queen to be laying in full flight and you'll get honey in your flow frames much quicker than if you add more boxes first so I'd always recommend starting in this configuration and then adding more boxes later once they've already filled half the flow frames. Now Cold climate beekeeping is typical to add another brood box though for more stores for the winter. So another brood box or another honey super would be somewhere where the bees can store more honey to get through a long winter. But as said, if you can start in this configuration, you're much more likely to get a nice flow frame harvest that season. Um, Alyssa on TikTok is wondering what causes a hive of bees to not want a queen? Oh, there's that teddy bear, isn't it? There it is. Teddy bear bee back again. <laughs> hive of bees to, to not want a queen. To not want a queen. Yeah. So there is a situation called hopelessly queenless <laughs> where perhaps they've lost their queen for a variety of reasons that could happen. Look at this teddy bear bee. It's very cool. That's what I was talking about earlier with our big bumblebee native bee here. There it goes. So hopelessly queenless is where they've lost their queen and they don't get it together to make another queen. And you come along as the beekeeper and decide to put in perhaps a frame with eggs on it that they could raise another queen from. But they don't. So then you go and put another frame in to raise a queen from, and they still don't. And then you buy in a queen, and you, you put the, uh, the queen in its little cage in, and when it emerges, they kill it. And, you, and that might be the question you're asking, is what causes them to not want a queen? And it seems to be prolonged, a prolonged time without a queen can get them into a mode where they will not accept a queen. I'm not sure why. But what you need to do about it is if you've tried and failed a few times then the best thing you can do to save the colony of bees is to merge them with another colony. So you could grab that brood box that don't have a queen and put it right on top of a, another hive with a sheet of newspaper in between. And poke some holes in the newspaper, make sure they've got ventilation and what will happen is the bees will chew away that newspaper and throw it out the front of the entrance and just slowly merge with each other and they're much less likely to fight when you shift one box of bees onto the top of another hive. 
Great, Casper's tuning in from uh, California and has just bought the family the starter bundle, which is, was on our website. Just wondering whether they should buy a package of bees or a nuke of bees. Package of bees or a nuke of bees. Now, if, if you can get a nuke of bees, then that is the easiest way to start because it's a going little hive there isn't the same time limit as a package to get in a box. You can get your new, you can put it in the garden and a month later you might pick a nice warm sunny day when you have time to shift those frames into your brood box, add the remaining frames, look after them and they'll grow from there. So nucleus is a already going little beehive and you're simply shifting four or five frames into the bottom box here, your brood box, looking after them and they'll grow. A package is where a beekeeper has shaken a whole lot of bees from a hive and sent them to you in the mail with a queen that's been bred in a little cage and usually some syrup in there to feed the bees while they're in transit. And that right arrives like this buzzing box of bees on your doorstep and you'll get some odd looks from the postal service. But that's basically an artificial swarm that you need to get into your hive straight away. So regardless of whether it's a good day for it or not, you'll need to get in your bee suit, put your gloves on, get out there and put them in to your brood box and get them going. So a little bit more demanding than the nucleus. Um, so someone's tuning in on Insta saying they've been told to never harvest more than 30% at a time from the hive. Is this true? Uh, it really depends on the season, so I would say not true because if you've got a lot of honey coming in, say it's springtime and there's a lot coming in, you might harvest them all and two weeks later they're full again. And that's very exciting when that happens. So you can go ahead and keep harvesting honey as it's coming in, but if you see that there's not a whole lot of nectar coming in, then it might be a good idea to exercise caution leave some frames for the bees. So that's in terms of leaving food for the bees. Now in terms of harvesting, it is less disruption for the hive if you harvest less frames at once. So the honey is a thermal mass for the bees and they keep it around the edges of the hive down here around the brood nest and they keep it above because it does create this nice thermal mass to help regulate the brood. If you go and take all the honey away in one hit, it is a bit more of a shock for the bees. And it's also a lot of work for them to do. And you'll notice if you take all of the frames at once, whether it be in conventional methods or with a flow hive, half the bees will be out in the front, allowing space for the rest of the bees to clean up all of those frames and allow ventilation to control the humidity in the hive, which will really spike if you're if you're harvesting all the frames at once. And the other reason is if you do get some honey spills, depending on the way the bees have capped the flow frames and also depending on uh, any issues that might arise, if there's spills inside the hive, they will be quarantined to not very much if you're harvesting only a few frames at a time. So if you're worried about that, harvest less frames and you're unlikely to have any problems. Great, this is an um, endless summer living in Alaska, how great is that? Um, wants to know, just starting out with their beehives, just wondering should they paint the hive a dark colour for heat retention in Alaska? Oh, that might be a great one for Alaskan beekeepers to tune in. Our team was over there filming some great honey harvesting in Alaska uh, almost two years ago now and it's great to, to see people way up there harvesting honey with their flow hives. Now, dark colours in really hot climates will heat up the hive more. But as I said, you're in a cold climate, so it could be a good idea to get a bit of extra warmth into the hive. But if you're familiar with really cold areas, then chime in and help us answer that. Broadly, the bees don't care what colour the hive is and they'll do fine no matter what colour it is and they're great little air conditioners when it's hot by collecting water and using evaporating cooling techniques by fanning the water 
and they can cool the hive and when it's really cold they'll disconnect their wings from their wing muscles and vibrate their bodies to warm the hive so they can really control the temperature whether it be hot or cold. One thing I would say is make sure they've got plenty of ventilation if you are in a hotter time. So we've got a lot of ventilation control on our hive. If you have a look down here, vents up will allow air to go through the back there, up under the screen bottom water into the hive. If we turn that around so the vents are down, that'll block off that ventilation. If you take the tray out altogether, it will provide an incredible amount of ventilation, which you might like to do in a really hot climate. Oh, great, Cedar. Um, Kit Kat's wondering, why is this honey so dark? It's a good question. Look how dark it I is. Know, look it, at it. It uh, looks to me like it's the bees have foraged on the heathland down here where we get quite a lot of dark honey coming in from the banksias and things. And we harvested other honey from this hive, which was still dark, but not as dark. That one you can see through, but you can hardly see through this one, which has a real dark malty flavor. And it's one of the great things uh, I think about flow hive beekeeping is having different colored frames of honey and different flavors to match. There's as many different flavors in the world as there is flowers that produce nectar. So you can't always tell what it is but it's exciting to be able to share those flavours and bring that story to the table. Brenda's wondering, did the bees get really mad and move out eventually because they keep seeing you taking their honey? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't had that issue. There was, I remember in the beginning, there was a lot of scepticism with our brand new product, which is fair enough. And one of the things that people were worried about was the bees going, oh, I don't like this home and, and nicking off, which is called absconding and we haven't found that to be an issue after all down here where you're starting your hive it's just wooden wax the way it's always been in fact what we promote is keeping it perfectly natural without even any plastic or wax foundation letting them do their thing down there in the bottom box size the cells from themselves and there's said to be a health benefit for that and then only once they've really built up the then go and put our Flow Hive Honey Super on, which has the moving parts and partly formed cells. The bees will cover it all in wax and connect all the cell parts together and then start storing their honey. So what I've found over a decade of inventing was bees aren't particularly programmed just to make hexagon cells they'll actually use whatever guides you give them to create meaningful honey storage. So I've successfully had them do upside down facing square honeycomb. And they'll do that if you give them a grid guide. And so when we give them hexagons, which I guess they're more familiar with, that are partly formed, they go ahead and join the parts and turn it into useful honey storage. And very useful for us to be able to harvest honey in this easy gentle way. There's our teddy bear bee again, look at that. Give us a thumbs up if you can see that. Look at that, loving that. Oh, I think it's the blue salvia that plant, look at it. Blue salvia, Isn't plant it? purple flowers in your garden oh, no, if you're here that. in Australia and watch the blue banded and the teddy bears come to forage. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> That's so exciting. Now John's in North Carolina and I've um, got a few questions but one of the first ones is must have a classic hive and just wondering what's the best way to keep the ants out of his classic hive if he doesn't have the ant guards? So you've got the classic, you don't have this base here, you can upgrade to this base if you give Trace a call who's reading out the questions but you can just make your own ant guard by any kind of uh, blocks that might sit in pots of water and then you can keep topping up those pots of water as they evaporate and that will create a moat that the ants can't walk across. Another simple idea if you don't want to do that is get some cinnamon powder, throw it behind the covers here and that will deter the ants. If you do that a couple of times, brush them away, some cinnamon, don't forget to do up here as well, then you'll find that that might just be enough to send the ants off 
to create a new home and do under that roof as well. Great, this is a good one. When you're um, a new beekeeper, when you look in the windows, what does the honey look like? Is it the dark patches or is that the wax? Just not sure what they should be looking for to then be getting ready to harvest their honey. Okay, so this is a bit hard to see because there's so many bees, but beneath their feet you can see the wax capping that they're still standing on. They're starting to chew that away because we've harvested the honey from beneath their feet. Now, if we, let's see if we can find another hive that might have some open honey cells to show you what that is like. So there we go. If you come in here into the blue salvia, you see Give us a thumbs up if you can see the open honey cells there. So that's when they haven't capped it yet. So what they're doing now is fixing up all the cells from our last harvest and adding their nectar and evaporating the nectar, adding their special source, their enzymes, and creating what we call honey. So when it's ready to harvest, you'll see the capping that's being put on top. I'll show you one more example of the capping to show you what it looks like when it is ready to harvest. Now over here on this side you've got, there we go, a great example of capped honey. So that frame is ready to harvest. There's no open hexagon shaped cells. It, there's a wax sheet right over the top of, of the frame there like a lid on a preserving jar saying well, we're going to keep that honey for later and lucky for us they store a lot more than they need and we can share some too. And in the rear view, this is a very useful view here, we've been harvesting a lot from this hive so there's not many frames left but you can see this one still has capped honey in the rear window view here and you can see if you look down beneath, between the frames the capping they've put on so that frame is ready to harvest. Whereas this one, if you have a look down there, it's not only empty at the back, but there's open cells as well. So between these two views, you can get a good idea of when it's time to harvest and when it's time to leave the rest of the honey for the bees. Great, so Cedar, on. question come in, now that you've shown the one, the frame on this one, the window rather, and it looks capped on that end frame, but you can only see some of the end window with it, honey, would you still harvest that or would you wait for them to fill all those Gaps up. A great question. If you can see that they've capped the frame on the side window, go ahead and harvest that frame. If there's capping there, this is one of the last places they'll cap the frame, then the rest will be capped most likely. So you can go ahead and harvest it. It's typical for them to leave their corners uncapped like they have here. But if you can see the honey in that side window, go ahead and harvest. Great. Country Girl Suburban World is asking, is there a certain time when you need to replace frames because the comb has got too dark and old? The brood frames. I oh, guess. the brood frames, yeah. yes. Okay, the brood frames, they can get dark and old and it's a good idea to cycle them out. So after a couple of seasons of the bees using the frames for their brood, the silk cocoons build up, uh, potentially um, pathogen loads build up and it's a good idea to freshen up your brood nest and we call that spring management where you go into the hive and you either take a split and take half of the frames to another hive and put in fresh empty frames for the bees to start building on and that also limits the tendency to swarm while you're at it. Now. If you don't want to take a split, you can just take some of the frames away from the edge. Typically they've only got honey and no brood in them and you can take the frame out. If it's naturally drawn comb, you can just cut it right out there, take that back to your kitchen and then place that wooden frame back in the center again. And that will provide a fresh area for the bees to do their amazing comb building and for the queen to lay and that'll really help limit swarming and cycle out old frames. So it's a great idea in the springtime to then do that on either side. So you've got a couple of fresh ones in the middle and any other time of year when you see uh, an old dark frame 
where the cells are getting smaller and smaller because the silk cocoons really has, has uh, built up a lot, then you could take that frame and put it on the edge, waiting for a good time to cycle it out, wait for the brood to emerge, or you could cut the wax and comb right out of the edge one if there's no brood in it and shift that to the center. So doing those two things will keep it fresh here in the brood box and it will actually lead to more healthy bees without any pathogen loads building up here in the brood nest. Um, got a couple of keepers in Melbourne, down in Victoria here where it's starting to get cold. Um, just wondering, I guess the winter time, Mike's running a couple of brood boxes with the Flow Super on top. Just wondering what you know advice coming up, should they remove the Super? Um, and we've got a couple of people tuning in on the same question actually. Should they remove the Super in winter time? And is there any chance that if you didn't remove the Super and it was really cold, would the Flow Frames freeze? So you won't have any trouble with the flow frame parts. It doesn't matter if they get frozen. What you might find if you leave the super on in a long cold winter, if you live in areas that have long cold winters, you might find the honey goes candied in the frames. The bees will still use that as a, as a food source. So in Melbourne, you, you have a choice. The minimum thing I suggest you do is take out the queen excluder, which is the grid in here and that way the queen can move up with the bees as they consume the remaining honey in your flow frames. If you don't remove the excluder, there's a chance she could be left behind and perish in the cold while the bees move up to consume honey here. So that would be the minimum. Other people will decide to harvest the honey and remove the flow frame for the winter. However, if there's no other stores, you might be better off leaving the flow super on if there's some stores in here for the bees to survive during the winter. So in that area you could go either way. We've got some great videos on winter pack downs at thebeekeeper.org. I'm not an, S, uh, an expert, we've got experts from all over the world tuning in on that program. It's a, a course we put together to take you from square one right through to even a deep scientific knowledge in beekeeping. So have a look at thebeekeeper.org, it's also a great fundraiser and we've, we've created a lot of high quality ecosystems already with uh, 1.5 million trees planted and a range of projects that have been support, supported to help our not only European honeybees but all the native bee species and everything that th thrives on the natural ecosystems which we of course need more of. Great, and a few people tuning in from all around the world and wondering how to purchase and um, we'll put a little post up, but honeyflow.com, if you jump on that website, it'll sort of put you into the right direction, where to purchase, the price and all of that, um, or contact customer support and we'll help you out as well. Um, Daniel's interested, newbie in the USA, loving the flow hive, but only wants to have one, like our setup, one brew box and one super. But just wondering if they keep growing naturally, how will he sort of manage that without sort of wanting to then have multiple hives? So there's a few things you can do there. The easiest one is to see if somebody wants to take a split and they'll do the spring management for you and take some of the frames out of the brood box alleviate the primary cause of swarming, which is the, the trigger of not having enough room for the queen to lay. So that could be a good way to go. Uh, another one is if you make your hive bigger, then they're unlikely to swarm. So if you add another brood box and another super, potentially four boxes high, then they'll usually always have enough space and they're less likely to swarm. And you can just keep a, a, a uh, larger, but single hive. But your question was how to keep it in this configuration with a single brood box and a single super. And the question, uh, genetics would be the only way to go with that. If you have some less swarmy genetics, perhaps you've purchased a queen off a queen breeder, then you can keep it in this configuration for years. And I've successfully done that at home with the hive outside my door. We're up to year number six and the queen's just failing now and the population's dropping, but they have not swarmed for six years and they're in this configuration. So that's a genetic trait, whether they're really swarmy or not. So that could be a good way to go if you want to just keep one hive 
and keep it in this configuration is to ask for bees that are less swarmy. Great, this is a pretty common question too that Tyson's asking on TikTok. They have the Flow Hive 2 Plus and with all our Flow Hives, do you still have to keep it tilted when you're not harvesting? Look, you don't, but we just find it easier to just maintain the tilt as it is. So all you have to do is walk up like we did today, put your honey jar, turn the handle, and the honey comes out, everything's set up right. And we put levels in the side of the hive and in the back so that if the ground shifts over time, which it does typically in a garden, you can re-level it by adjusting each foot. However, if you want to slope it the other way for some reason, then you'll need to slope it back when it comes time to harvest, which isn't too much of a problem. You might be just taking some blocks out of under here by lifting and taking them out. However, it's one more thing to do that it becomes a hassle. So I recommend just keeping it in the configuration as it is all year round. And there's one more reason why you should do that and that's this leak back point. I'm not seeing an example here to show you, but typically honey can build up in here. The bees don't do a great job of sealing the parts. You can get some honey dripping through. And what we want it to do is to go back into the hive via that little leak back point there. And if you're have the slope the other way so tilted forward then this won't work and you'll get honey building up in there that can't return to the hive and fermentation or candied honey may occur in this trough area so good idea to keep it with the three degree slope we've designed it for at all times Great. A couple of people mentioning wasps seed are getting into their hive. Um, someone's tuned in and said that they've noticed that their bees fight the wasps away at the front like guard bees. But just wondering, are there any, any um, tips on how to maybe keep the wasps away from getting into their hives? So in Australia, we don't have wasps that will bother your hive. In other countries, you've got the yellow jackets and they will actually prey on the bees storm the entrance, come in and decimate your colony if you're not careful. So what I recommend doing is narrowing your entrance to make it unlikely for the wasps to, to be able to get past your guard bees. So if you've got wasps, use our entrance reducer and that will make the entrance about this wide and that way your bees can do a better job of defending against those yellow jackets that are coming to prey on your bees. Fantastic. Someone's just spotted seeds. We're getting mentioned there's a little bee having a little swim in our honey. Wow, blue banded oh, bee oh, here. The blue, oh my god. So we had the teddy bear bee now, we've got the blue banded bee. Look at that. Yes, well noticed. What yeah. we'll do is show you how to fish that out. Bees can be in honey save for a long bee. time. <laughs> we'll save this this poor bee that's uh, gone for the gold. Now typically that can happen especially if the bees are a bit hungry and if you find that to be a problem simply cover up your jar using some kitchen wrap or one of those nice wax wraps but there it is. All we need to do is put that back on the landing board and that bee will be just fine. I'll do that now and the other bees will quickly clean it up and she will be just okay. So I'm going to put it right there. There we go. The other bees are already into it, cleaning away that honey. <laughs> nice one. See that, Laurie's asking how many years do the flow frames last? It's a great question. We've designed them to last as long as we can. We're not a company that's trying to build a uh, replacement redundancy. We want the frames to last as long as they can. So chime in and let us know how they're going. People chimed in last week to tell us that their frames are still good and they got them in 2015. So we're going on nine years now. Having said that, we don't have a flawless record. We have had issues out there and, and we've looked after our customers. So if you do have problems, let us know and we'll do our best to look after you and make sure your frames last as long as we possibly can. Now after about five years 
the wax build up, which you can see here in this frame, this has been through multiple seasons, you can see the wax building up. And sometimes it can get quite dark and really it can be hard to see through this view anymore. And this view is a great, a great sort of view to check the health of your hive. Look at that cheeky bee. You might need to cover up the honey. There we go. Back you go. And the, uh, the build up can look unsightly after a while. It won't affect the performance of your flow frames, but they might start not using the end of the frame so much if there's mold build up and so on in the extremities. So what you can do is take the frames out after harvesting, leave them in the, oh, set them in the open position and then get a pressure washer and blast all the old wax off. Even better, connect a hot water service to your pressure washer and the, the heat and the power will blow a lot of the wax off. Let them dry, set them in their correct position, self-formed and put them back in and that way you'll, you'll clean up this. Not perfectly as if they were new but you'll clean a lot of the wax away and that'll give your bees a fresh start again. Great, this, I probably might say this word wrong but Sham Kimbo is asking that it, it's early spring and the bees have only just woken up. They are weakened by tropolalaps. Um, just wondering are there such kind of problems and how do you deal with it? Okay, the tropolalaps mite is a, an internal mite that the bees can get and you haven't uh, had issues here but if you have had issues with that mite let us know what to do about it and how to look after our bees if they've got that issue. It's great to see people chiming in from all over the world helping people answer all those questions that we don't have the answer to here. Yvonne um, got a swarm a couple of days ago even though it was very late in the season. Just wondering how do you catch a swarm when they're in a really difficult position? Okay so swarms will be swarms and they will land wherever they like and sometimes it's very difficult. They might be high in a tree and you don't have a ladder tall enough. Now we'll post a link to a swarm catch I did over here on the mango tree where I got a extendable pole, the type you use for a pool. And I taped a cardboard box onto the top, nice and open, and I simply put that underneath the swarm and give it a shake like that. Most of the bees fall into the box and then you can slide that pole down and tip it in to your brood box, put the lid on, and if you've got the queen in there, the rest of the bees will follow and you've got a good swarm catch. So that's a that's a great tip and one of the easy ways to go. Some people create crazy systems with the vacuum cleaners and suction tubes and suck up bees. I haven't had the best luck with that. I found the bees got a bit damaged. So I tend to go for, for either getting up that tree, which can be a bit risky, so look after yourself, and um, either cutting the branch they're on and lowering it gently, or using an extendable pole, which is much easier. And if they're way out of reach, there's not much you can probably do, unless you've got an arborist brother like I do, to go and get that swarm from the very top of a tree. So you can't catch all the swarms, and that's a great reason to do your spring management and limit the swarming activity in your apiary. Yeah, um, Yvonne's tuning back in, who was asking the question, Cedar, about the swarm. They're actually in a choco vine and a gate, so they're quite low, but hard to get out of the vine. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. in a choco vine, yeah. low. Well, low swarms are much easier. Uh, so what could you do? What I would probably do is push a brood box as close as you can underneath, and then you might actually want to snip some of the vines carefully, not, trying not to disturb the swarm, and then move as much of it as you can together to get a good shake into your box. And if you get the queen, the rest will follow. If you're really skilled, you might be able to spot the queen and put her in a little queen clip, put her in your hive and the rest of the bees will follow. So, but that's a, a bit more advanced but you should be able to get them in if you, if you work hard with that swarm just by getting that brood, nest, uh, brood box as close as you can underneath, pushing it right into the vines. 
don't worry if when you put the lid on you've got a bit of foliage in there just trying to get the queen in there try and get them settled and hopefully your swarm will stay great john's another question wondering is jasmine the flower the bushes are they bad for bees ah i haven't heard that but chime in if you've heard about jasmine having issues with bees it's certainly a strong and beautiful fragrance that i imagine translates into a very potent honey. Totally. Cedar, just wondering when you finish harvesting with this honey, do you have to leave the key in the flow frame? You, you don't, but let's close this off now, just for the purposes of answering your question. We haven't got a full jar, but we've got a fair bit, and it really depends on how much honey was stored in that frame as to how much you'll get out. So while we could get another bit of honey if we left it for, for another half an hour, we might just wrap this up and leave the rest to go back to the bees. So when you close the frame, well first of all, when you open it, you leaving it there for a minute is good to make sure all of the frame parts lift. And the same when you close it, if you insert this into the top slot, all the way till you feel it stop at the back, then you can turn that to a 90 which is quite easy to turn on the way back, but leave it there for a minute or two to make sure all those cell parts push down into that cell form position. There's the blue banded bee, look at that. We've got great action in our little pollinator garden here today. Right there is the blue banded bee with its amazing blue stripes. When we first put that out on our channel in 2015, people thought it was CGI and the was no such bee in the world, but there it is, the blue banded bee. They fly quite differently, don't they, Cedar? Like they're quite jittery, so. They do, and they've got a good buzz on them. They're buzz pollinators like the teddy bear bees. Uh, nice, give us a thumbs up if you can see wow. those blue stripes. Callum on the camera there, doing a great job. <laughs> So Cedar, would you leave much honey in the hives now for winter? Would you take any more honey out of this hive? Uh, we can take all the honey this time of year because what we have in our winter is actually quite a good flow. And when I say flow, flowers that produce nectar. So we have the paper bark down here and it will kick off with these rains and it'll pulse with nectar all through the autumn and winter and then the spring will kick in. So we can go ahead and harvest in our winter. We actually get less honey in the late summer than we do in the winter time here. We're in a subtropical region, so we can harvest just about any time of year, provided we're seeing honey storing in the frames. And in tropical regions, it's the same, except for you might have big wet seasons. And then when you move into the colder regions, that's when you might need to leave honey stores for your bees to survive over a long, cold winter. Cedar, so, would you ever run a flow hive with two supers on it? Yes, we have done a lot of that. I find it easier just to keep it in this configuration, but you can go ahead and add another flow super that will provide you with more storage on the hive and it will help with the primary swarm trigger, which is too much congestion in the hive not enough room for the queen to lay eggs, nowhere to put the honey, and you, you might find the hive is then triggered to raise queens and swarm. So you can go ahead and build up a bigger hive. My preferred method is to leave it in this configuration for ease, because you can just go ahead and take that box off and do your brood inspections. You've only got eight frames or 10 frames to look through to find your queen and things like that. And as far as honey storage goes, I prefer to store it in jars on the shelf than in boxes on the hive. But conventionally, people would batch process, including me when I was keeping hives in the conventional way. You'd build up your honey supers when the flow was on, then you'd take all of those supers off at once, back to the shed, do your whole process of decapping, put them in a centrifuge, spin the honey out and so on, then put those frames back onto the hive again. Now, that made sense to batch process and keep adding supers to hives that 
were full of honey. But with the flow hive, you can keep harvesting as you go and store the honey in jars on the shelf instead of in tall stacks of hives. And that just means you don't have to have all of these honey supers sitting around with rodents attacking them and wax moth and so on. You can just keep a very simple, easy configuration like this. And it's less expense, you don't have to buy all of those other honey supers and the centrifuge and the decapping line and all of the things you might need to harvest in a conventional way. This is it, this is all you need to harvest a real amount of produce in your garden, a very small footprint, a very contained, no mess, no fuss way to harvest. So I prefer to keep it simple, but in colder regions, they do like to add more boxes for more honey stores over the winter time. So if you're in a colder region, you might like to add another brood box or another super, run a slightly bigger hive so that they have a lot to chew on to keep them alive over winter. Great, and we've got a great last question coming in here. Seeds wondering about the different flavours of honey through the spring and the winter. Do you have a preference? Uh, personally, at home I get a lot of the dark honey, which is often people's favourite, and less of the lighter honey. So I tend to favour the really light floral honeys that come in in the springtime and they're often very aromatic and sometimes overpowering for some people. But I just love all the different flavours. Most of all, I love having a variety of flavours and the Flow Hive's great for storing individual flavours in individual jars so you can experience that. But if I had to choose which honey I was going to put on my porridge, it would probably be the, the light springtime such as the wild quince here that you can see in the forest below and that has a very aromatic, strong flavour. All our Australian eucalypts have amazing flavours too. I get the ironbark flowering around my home and that's one of the most beautiful flavours when it comes in as well. Thank you very much for all your great questions. We've left that key in for plenty enough time. We can wrap this harvest up now by putting this cap back in the top like that. As said, you could wait for some time to uh, for the last dribbles to come out but we do have some rain coming in so we're going to grab our honey and run so i just need the little cap which i mustn't have put in the caddy all right for the purposes of this exercise i'll use this cap here and what i'm going to do is just do the hot swap and take out this tube and put the cap straight back in. I didn't even spill a drop of honey there and the remaining honey in the tube you can either enjoy or you can rest the little tongue on the tube against your jar and the remaining honey will go in. And that's a nice, neat way to finish your honey harvest. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Let us know if you've got things you'd like us to cover next week. We'll be back at the same time to help answer any questions you have. Thanks for tuning in.